a nightmare strikes, ripping a Dallas family apart. A father makes a desperate escape while his wife and child are taken by a drug dealer. FBI agents race against time to find the hostages and their abductor. A trail of bodies litters the path to Gino Camacho. Mother and child are kidnapped. A bystander is murdered. Violence such as this shattered a quiet Texas neighborhood and exposed a drug cartel that flourished where it was least expected. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. FBI field agents work to penetrate the secretive drug underworld, expose those involved, and crush the cartel. In the spring of 1988, narcotics had infiltrated the working class communities of Dallas, Texas. A rise in robberies and break-ins followed the drug trade. Some families retreated from the higher crime areas to the neighborhood of Pleasant Grove. Sam Wright, his three-year-old son Andre, and his wife Evelyn Banks found refuge among the porch lined streets. Here, residents looked out for one another. Then, early on May 20th, 1988, a gunshot shattered the morning silence. Through the shock of one onlooker, four armed men emerged from the right house, dragging the family to a car. Sam Wright managed to break free from the abductors and escaped. The neighbor who witnessed the incident ran to alert the authorities, while Wright dashed behind houses to avoid the gang. But help could not arrive before the gang stuffed Wright's family into the car and disappeared. Strangely, detectives had still not heard from Wright and the mystery of the morning's events deepened as detectives entered. Inside, the kidnapping investigation expanded to include a murder investigation as well. The police found the body of a young man lying face down in a pool of blood. A driver's license identified the victim as 25-year-old David Wilburn. Investigators were thorough and collected anything that seemed promising but there was little evidence to collect. They also dusted for fingerprints, but retrieved none foreign to the residence. Detectives spoke to the neighbor who called 911, hoping she could provide some answers. The interview revealed that Wilburn, the dead man found at the scene, was Sam Wright's nephew. But she didn't know why anyone would want Wilburn executed. Detectives also learned that the Latino man who drove the Lincoln had visited Sam Wright on previous occasions. But no one recognized the others. For investigators, larger questions remained. Where was Sam Wright? And why hadn't he contacted authorities about his family's abduction? Just one disturbing fact was clear. A mother and her three-year-old son were in the hands of killers. Given the urgency, the Dallas police called in the FBI. Special Agent Jose Figueroa was assigned to the case. Every time we, we receive information about kidnappings, that's, that's a priority case uh, in, in our standards, uh, especially when, when a kid is involved. And we don't, we don't wait 24 hours to respond to a kidnapping. Figueroa began by searching for Sam Wright, the man who had escaped from the gang. 
The FBI learned that Wright was a fugitive, on the run for three years after fleeing a drug conviction. This explained why Wright, the distraught father, had kept on running and not turned to the police. But the FBI agents needed him. If they were going to move forward and help the wife and child, they had to talk to Wright. Suspecting that Wright was hiding in the area, agents canvassed the Pleasant Grove neighborhood, talking to neighbors. That's what we did at the beginning. We inundated the whole area with our business cards and interview everybody, just asking for somebody to get in touch with Sam Wright for him to contact the FBI office. As hoped, one of Figueroa's business cards found its way into Wright's hands. The panic-stricken father risked capture by calling the FBI. He asked for the only person who could help his family, Agent Figueroa. Tass Bailey worked with Jose Figueroa mm -hmm. in the FBI Violent Crimes the Unit in Dallas. Sam told Jose that the individual who committed this offense was a guy named Gino, and that was all that Sam knew him by was Gino, but that he had been arrested several months before by the Mesquite Police Department for a murder committed down in the valley, the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Sam Wright refused to come to the FBI office, but promised to call again. Until then, the agents had one lead, the name Gino. We went out to the Mesquite Police Department and met with Captain Larry Sprague. Larry told us, he said, oh, I know exactly who you're talking about. You're talking about Gino Camacho. 33-year-old Gino Camacho was a known drug runner whose large shipments of marijuana were distributed and protected by a small gang of thugs. He was also known to have a girlfriend named Wanda Jackson. On Sunday, May 22nd, just two days after the abduction, agents tracked down Wanda Jackson. They asked her about Gino Camacho's whereabouts, but she denied having any knowledge of where the suspect was. She claimed that she hadn't seen Gino in weeks. The agents left with the suspicion that she was lying. If the FBI had Wright in custody, perhaps they could have negotiated a deal with Wanda as a go-between, letting Camacho believe he would be paid for his hostages. But the agents lacked the leverage that may have encouraged her to work with them. They needed to bring in Sam Wright. When Wright called the next day, they were ready with a tap and trace on the phone. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. An arrest team had already been dispatched to the downtown area. What does he look like? Come on, man. I don't have time to talk. Come on. Put some money on there. You know his name. When the payphone address came through, it was radioed to the field. The agents found Wright still using the phone, but they did not move in immediately. Though desperate to find his family, yeah. Sam yeah, Wright was a convicted man. drug dealer, a fugitive from the law. The FBI didn't know how far he might go to avoid capture. Agents spotted one man waiting in the car for the fugitive. Wright could have had others posted nearby, The agents wanted to reduce the risk of violent resistance by Wright and any of his associates. Okay, here we go. When they were confident that Wright and his driver had no other accomplices, the agents struck. FBI, out of the car! Wright was arrested without incident on his outstanding warrant and taken into custody. That's right. Agents Bailey and Figueroa began the interrogation of the captured fugitive. What's your tie-in with Gino? I don't have a tie Wright described the events of May 20th, 1988. It was any family's worst nightmare. 
On that day, Wright kept his young son, Andre, entertained. His wife, Evelyn, sat alone downstairs. They were in mourning. Wright's mother had recently passed away in Louisiana. He was expecting his nephew, David Wilbur, to arrive shortly and drive the family to the funeral. Wright watched for Wilburn's arrival since visitors did not have access to the front door. As a fugitive, Wright had installed burglar bars around the porch, thinking it would protect his family, both from the law and from his violent associates. But the bars could not withstand Gino Camacho's anger. Without warning, four men burst into the house brandishing automatic weapons. Sam Wright's past had caught up with him. The one he knew as Gino screamed that he wanted money that was owed him. Wright swore he didn't have it and pleaded for mercy. Gino's rage only escalated. At that moment, Wright's nephew, David Wilburn, arrived. He could not have come at a worse time. Though he was a large man, Gino's men quickly subdued him. Wright described his nephew as a gentle soul who never hurt anyone. Gino yelled that he meant business. To prove his point, he placed the muzzle of a 357 revolver to the back of Wilburn's head. A second later, a single shot brought instant death. Wright watched helplessly as the lifeless body of his nephew collapsed a few feet away. Sam Wright desperately wanted to help authorities, but he swore he didn't have any more information that could assist the investigators in locating his family. While Wright remained in custody, the clock continued ticking for his wife and son. To expedite leads, Dallas police and the FBI orchestrated a media campaign. Area newspapers and television stations featured pictures of Camacho's face. The authorities requested that citizens come forward with any information as to the suspect's whereabouts. This campaign yielded a tip from an unsavory source, another drug dealer. David Munoz, a small-time dealer, called the FBI and was connected to Agent Bailey. Munoz claimed that he recognized the kidnapper in a television news story. He said he had information that might be useful to the investigation. Did you call my office? Munoz arranged to want? meet Bailey in his Dallas office. motel late at night. He told I'm Bailey that he knew who Camacho's yeah. accomplices yeah. were. He even offered to turn Camacho over want? to the FBI well, as part of an unorthodox deal. And I got something you want. What, do you what want Munoz planned on doing was kind of taking over the collection of Camacho's drug debts and business dealings and wanted us to kind of turn a blind eye towards this. Uh, we basically told him no deal. Because there was only a weak connection to the case, Bailey did not you. arrest Munoz. Nevertheless, the FBI agent managed to extract one key name from the opportunist, Eddie Blaine Cummings. On the street, Cummings was known as Fast Eddie. A background check revealed he had a criminal record and had spent time in jail with Gino Camacho. Cummings was currently on parole for possession of illegal weapons. Special Agent Figueroa now had two names, Gino Camacho and Fast Eddie, as he canvassed area nightclubs. Armed with photos of Camacho and Fast Eddie, Figueroa found a bar patron who had recently seen the pair come in. The patron had heard Fast Eddie talk about a lunch appointment the next day up in Lawton, Oklahoma, about? a three-hour drive northwest of Dallas. An arrest team assembled in the parking lot of the Oklahoma restaurant on the morning of August 12, 1988. The plan was to wait until Fast Eddie exited the crowded restaurant to isolate him from bystanders. Investigators were poised to strike. Fast Eddie was their closest link to Camacho so far. 
When the door opened, the arrest team descended, nabbing Fast Eddie before he could flee. One associate of Camacho's gang was now in custody. Agents hoped Fast Eddie could lead them closer to the missing mother and son. In the summer of 1988, Dallas FBI agents searched for a missing mother and child abducted at gunpoint by a drug gang. Fast Eddie, an associate of the gang, was now in custody. Under interrogation, Fast Eddie denied having anything to do with the kidnapping in Dallas. Come on, Eddie, the kidnapping at the right house. But eventually, he did tell them what he knew of the crime. This was the first time we had actually learned who all was involved and the names of the individuals the morning of the abduction. Fast Eddie fingered Camacho and two other gang members, Juan Jackson and David Cook. He and David Cook had grown up together in Stephenville, Texas, a two-hour drive from Dallas. As far as Fast Eddie knew, Cook was probably back in their hometown. Bailey and Figueroa needed to get Cook, trusting that the lead might take them one step closer to Camacho and the missing mother and child. They sought a contact in Stephenville and found the name of Detective Don Miller. On August 15, 1988, Detective Don Miller called back Agent Bailey. Miller had found the suspect working at his family's convenience store. The detective would hold him until the agents arrived. Miller warned Cook that if he knew something, it would be best to cooperate with the oh, FBI. Yeah. Yeah, you boys One member of the him. gang that kidnapped Evelyn and Andre yeah. Banks was now in custody. The FBI was a step closer to Camacho and the missing pair. Agents rushed to Stephenville, hoping David Cook yeah. may lead them to Camacho yeah, and his hostages before yeah, time ran call. out for the mother and son. Well, a couple of months ago. He had decided to help investigators with the case in the hopes of a lighter sentence. Over two days of interrogation, Cook detailed his version of the events of May 20th, 1988. On the morning of the assault, Camacho picked up Cook and two more associates. He said they were going to collect a debt. Camacho had given Sam Wright $20,000 worth of marijuana to deal, but Wright had claimed it was stolen. Camacho swore he'd get his money back. Gang member Juan Jackson opened up a bag and started passing out guns. The arsenal included submachine guns and the 357 pistol. Camacho sent another gang member, Larry Merrill, around back to cut the phone line. No one was going to call for help. Juan Jackson cut through the padlock burglar bars, while David Cook and Camacho kept watch. They burst in the front door and found Evelyn Banks in the living room. Camacho had his men sweep the house, guns drawn. Where's my wine? Where's my wine? Where's my 20 grand? Just this. The gang corralled the terrified family into the living room as Camacho's fury rose. He said that if the family didn't cooperate, they would die. Camacho told him to put the baby on the sofa next to his mother and that if the baby moved or caused any problems, to shoot him. Gino started screaming how uh, they had ripped him off how they had uh, not treated him with respect, and he wanted his money and he wanted it now. Amid all the shouting, there came a knock at the door. The assailant's first thought was that the neighbors had summoned the police. Camacho and Jackson moved into position, prepared to fire on the police they thought were on the other side of the door. Come in. 
When David Wilburn walked through the front door, he was surrounded by the armed gang. The gunman threw him to the ground without a struggle. Camacho ordered Jackson to shoot him. But when he hesitated, Camacho turned to Cook. But when Cook refused, Camacho grabbed the gun from his hand and showed everyone just how serious he was. Camacho yelled that no one was going to show him disrespect anymore. Grab my gun and he just blows the guy away. Under intense questioning, Cook never wavered on the facts, including that Camacho was the shooter. His story matched Sam Wright's version. After they left the house, Camacho remained furious that Wright had escaped. But the gang didn't give chase. They knew the police would soon be summoned in force to the Pleasant Grove neighborhood. Instead, Camacho ordered them all to Cook's apartment, where he could decide their next move. Camacho figured they could lay low there with the hostages. Paul Macaluso was the assistant U.S. attorney who tracked the case. They were concerned about damage control. They had two witnesses to a murder, to a capital murder, and what to do about them. Cook told agents that a new gang member, Spencer Stanley, was called to the apartment to guard the hostages while he and Camacho were away dealing drugs at a nearby hotel. Juan Jackson didn't stay much longer. Fearing the heat from the authorities, he cleaned the guns, took some getaway cash, and left the gang for good. While Stanley kept watch over the hostages, Cook and Camacho drove to the hotel to make the drug deal. There, just two days after the abduction, Camacho got a call from his girlfriend, Wanda Jackson. She had a cryptic message for him. Hey, your big brother was just here? Yeah. Big brother, of course, referring to the federal authorities, the FBI, had been to the house. The same girlfriend that had sworn to the FBI that she had no idea of Camacho's whereabouts reached him moments after the agents left her. In trouble. I don't know how. Her warning gave the gang a head start on the pursuing agents. Camacho returned to Cook's apartment. He told Evelyn that he wasn't angry with her, only with her husband over the money. I'm not after you. He said he would release her and Andre if she promised not to go to the authorities. The man owed me the money. She agreed. Throw you around the way I did. With that pledge, Camacho said he would take them to a private airstrip in Oklahoma for a flight to California. There they would remain safe until Camacho settled up with Wright. At the end of a grueling interrogation session, Cook told agents that Evelyn and Andre never made it to California. There was no plane for them to board. Cook knew where they were left across the Texas state line near Ardmore, Oklahoma. In August of 1988, special agents from Dallas's Violent Crimes Unit had arrested one member of a Texas gang responsible for one murder and the abduction of a mother and child. While in custody, Cook pointed special agents Jose Figueroa and Tass Bailey north to Oklahoma. It was the next stepping stone towards their ultimate goal, finding Evelyn and Andre Banks and their abductor, Gino Camacho. According to Cook, Camacho had driven Evelyn and Andre Banks to a remote area across state lines. The gang leader had promised to fly the mother and child to her relatives in California from an airstrip that was concealed behind the trees. They pulled the car off the side of the road and together headed into the woods. Spencer Stanley led the way, carrying three-year-old Andre. In a few hours, 
She thought she would be on the West Coast, where she would remain until her husband paid the drug debt he owed Camacho. But as they walked deeper into the woods, Evelyn found no clearing for a plane to land. No! Then she saw the hole. No! No! In an instant, she realized what it meant. She fainted from the shock. There was no airstrip, no flight to freedom. She and her son had been brought here to die. Spencer Stanley dropped her child into the open grave. Camacho fired four times. Then they threw Evelyn in on top of her son and shot her as well. Evelyn Banks and her three-year-old son, Andre, died on May 23, 1988. This was the grisly scene that David Cook told agents he was leading them to. The agents had just about reached their frustration point when Cook at last recognized the area. The search for Camacho's victims began in the punishing heat of late summer. The federal kidnapping case had escalated into a homicide case as well. Camacho had now killed three people. But if the agents wanted to prove their case against the killer, they had to find the bodies. To pinpoint the burial site, the agents began a line search through the trees. And as we walked in behind those cedar trees, you could see a depression in the ground where someone had dug. All the side had been torn off. When investigators reached the site, three months had passed since the murders. They began the painstaking excavation. They removed small loads and sifted through the dirt, careful not to miss or destroy any evidence. Near the surface, agents found shell casings from a 380 caliber weapon. That fit with Cook's account that Camacho had fired a small, semi-automatic pistol. The digging continued at a painfully yep. slow pace. Like they've all been here about the same time. You gotta remember, this is the end of August. It was about 95 degrees, about 90% humidity. We were in that area of the tree, so there was no, no air movement. I mean, we were just stuck in there. We'd been digging for about two hours. Then one of the agents struck something hard. It sounded hollow. Another blow right, broke through the shell-like crust. A foul stench suddenly overwhelmed the agents. And the god-awful smell of decaying uh, human body came out of the hole, and we both, uh, we both jumped out of the hole and uh, went over in the bushes and got sick and then had to go back into it again. Before burying Evelyn and Andre, Camacho and his men covered the bodies with cat litter to help hide the odor. But the clay in the cat litter absorbed moisture from the bodies, then hardened into an airtight shell, reducing the rate of decomposition and preserving the bodies for autopsy. Despite the nauseating stench, the agents pressed on. They put Vicks vapor rub under their noses to suppress the odor and continued working. They were determined to construct an impenetrable case against Camacho and his gang. Cook then led agents to nearby Lake Texoma, where he said the gang had disposed of the weapons after the killing. A dive team from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation combed the lake bottom. They came up with more casings from the 380. And then they found the handgun. The physical evidence against Gino Camacho was now solid, corroborating eyewitness testimony. The federal agents were confident they could secure a conviction on two counts of kidnapping and three of murder. But Camacho remained at large, and agents learned he had killed again. Cook told the FBI he could lead them to that body as well. In late August of 1988, the FBI in Dallas had captured David Cook, a member of a violent Texas drug gang. The gang's leader, Gino Camacho, wanted for kidnapping and three murders, was still at large. Cook was cooperating with agents in the hunt for Camacho. 
he had led investigators to the burial site of Camacho's most recent murder victims. But during the two-day trip to recover the bodies of Evelyn and Andre Banks in Oklahoma, Cook surprised agents with another tale of Camacho's terror. This time, Camacho had released his rage on a woman named Pamela Miller. Agents now turned their focus to her whereabouts. Agents learned that Pam Miller worked as an exotic dancer in a Dallas strip club. She met Camacho and started hanging out with his gang. Cook told agents that he and Miller joined Camacho one night in June of 1988. It had been just three weeks since Camacho had shot and killed three people, but he had risked a trip to Dallas to arrange another drug deal. The buyer showed up at a hotel bar and began negotiating. But Pam interrupted the transaction. Pam Miller recognized the purchaser as somebody who came into the club where she had danced. And she recognized him, and she told him so. I know you. You came into the club. Well, not surprisingly, this had a chilling effect on the transaction. The buyer skipped out. The deal was dead. You have any idea what you just did? I know him from where I dance at. You do? Camacho became furious at Pam for messing up the drug deal. And Cook and Pam and Camacho walked out of the hotel. As soon as they got in the car, Camacho started beating Pamela. Pamela then made some comments to Camacho uh, attacking his manhood, which only infuriated him more. As they drove, Camacho's rage boiled over. Cook and Stanley had seen the results of his temper before. They knew where it could lead, yet they were too intimidated to speak up. Camacho's brutal beating didn't stop until Miller had lost consciousness. Stop the car! Still enraged, Camacho ordered Cook to stop the car. He dragged Miller onto the road, laid her limp body behind the right rear tire, and yelled for Cook to back up. Back to car! Now! Cook obeyed. They drove down to Stephenville. They went to an apartment that was rented by David Cook. And they took Pamela's body and put it in a 55-gallon drum, stuck it out on the patio, stuck a bag of trash on top of it so no one would see there was a body in it. They stayed there for the weekend. Camacho, Stanley, Cook. They sat around drinking beer and partying until Camacho decided to dispose of the body. So we asked David, well, where will we find Pamela's body? And he said, you won't. And we said, why not? He said, well, we chopped her up and put her in a tree mulcher. While I was driving the car, Jose was in the front seat I looked at Jose, he looked at me, uh, our mouths dropped open, and I almost ran off the highway. I, I couldn't believe what I had just heard. Cook led FBI agents to the wooded site on the ranch where they had pulverized the body. It seemed impossible that they would find any remains. Not only would the shredder have pulped the body, but it was now some two months after the insidious act. It was likely that the hot Texas sun had decayed the remains even further. Despite the odds, agents set out to recover what they could. From Cook's account, the agents figured out the shredder's discharge path. They set up a grid system and began meticulously scouring the scene. The process took hours, but the hard work yielded dividends. From the ground, agents recovered bone shards and tissue. In the tree branches above, they found more tissue dried by the sun. Each item was bagged and labeled based on its location. The agents also recovered teeth. A check with Pamela Miller's dental records allowed a positive identification of the victim. 23-year-old Pamela Miller had been Camacho's fourth murder in as many weeks. 
yet her murderer was still at large. And every day he remained free, Camacho posed a threat to anyone that crossed his path. But a major break in the case soon followed when the family of Spencer Stanley, the gang member who had helped Camacho kill three victims, contacted the FBI. They tipped the agents off that Stanley was hiding in a trailer park in Huntsville, Alabama. Stanley told investigators that he had thrown the 357 Camacho used to kill David Wilburn into Lake Ray Hubbard near Dallas. An FBI dive team searched the bottom of the Texas lake. They never found a gun. I got something. But they did find a casing from a 357 and several live rounds. The recovered bullets were taken to the FBI's Materials and Devices Unit in Washington, D.C. for neutron activation analysis. Agents hoped that the bullets from Lake Ray Hubbard could be matched to the bullet that killed Camacho's first victim, David Wilburn. Neutron activation analysis is based on the fact that lead bullets are created in batches, and each batch of lead is unique. The FBI examiners needed to prepare the bullets for the test by removing the slugs from the shells, readying them for transportation to a nuclear reactor. Lead samples from each bullet were lowered into the reactor's core. The samples absorbed neutrons and became radioactive. The radioactivity was measured and gave a precise reading of the chemical elements found in the lead, a radioactive signature. Examiners concluded that the signatures from each bullet were identical. The bullets from Lake Ray Hubbard and Wilburn's body had come from the same batch of ammunition. Though the physical evidence against Camacho continued to build, it didn't put the authorities any closer to locating the fugitive. Through an informant, the FBI learned that Camacho had escaped to Mexico and was hiding in a small town just south of the Texas border. U.S. authorities sought to have him arrested and extradited. But Mexican authorities were unable to cooperate. They claimed that the town where Camacho stayed was controlled by drug kingpins who were heavily armed. If the Mexican police attempted an arrest, there would be heavy casualties. The FBI would need another plan to bring the gang leader to justice. After four murders in the US, drug dealer Gino Camacho had escaped to Mexico out of reach of the FBI. But without his gang or the drug trade that had supported them, his money began to run out. By the spring of 1989, Camacho was in desperate need of cash. He still had suppliers in Mexico, if he could locate a buyer in the States. Because he feared crossing back into the U.S., he searched for a middleman with narcotics distribution contacts north of the border. The low-level go-between Camacho stumbled upon worked as an informant for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency. The informant reported to his DEA handler that a man named Gino wanted to set up a drug deal. DEA agent John Lunt was based in Fort Worth, Texas. He was aware that Gino Camacho was wanted by the FBI. What you got for me? Suspecting that this Gino was Gino Camacho, Lunt told his informant that he wanted to go ahead with the deal. Lunt then called FBI agent Tass Bailey with good news. John told me that it sounded like this was Gino Camacho. I then provided John with a photograph of Camacho, which he showed to his informant, and the informant confirmed that that, in fact, was the, the individual with whom he had met. To get the fugitive across the border, the FBI offered Camacho a deal he couldn't refuse. Their informant told Camacho that an American distributor wanted to buy a million dollars worth of marijuana. But the distributor needed to finalize the deal in person. He wasn't comfortable doing such a large deal with someone he'd never met. 
To calm Camacho's fears about entering the U.S., the informant told Camacho the distributor would advance Gino $100,000 when they met in the border town of McAllen, Texas. But there was one problem with this thing. Field agents needed a means of visually identifying the fugitive amongst other border crossers. To make Camacho stand out, the informant sent codes he said would enable the distributor to identify him. The arrest team committed the clothing to memory, Hawaiian shirt, blue shorts, and a green-brimmed baseball cap. Camacho got the package of clothes at a friend's apartment where he often hung out. But no one could be sure an experienced smuggler like Camacho would not be too suspicious to wear the outfit. We knew that this was going to be our only shot at him, that once he figured he'd been set up, that the informant would be burned, and he would be even more cautious than before in doing any type of transaction that would afford us an opportunity to arrest him. So we set up uh, very elaborate arrest plans. On the day of the deal, agents scanned the border crossing for Camacho. They hoped they could find him in the crowd by the telltale clothes that the smuggler had been sent. Then, the arrest team spotted him in the outfit. Camacho didn't realize the place was swarming with federal agents, dressed as patrol guards, tourists, and passers-by. They all had memorized the outfit and his picture. Calmly posing as a tourist, he started across the bridge that spanned the border. FBI agents dressed as border patrol guards approached Camacho. The fugitive played it cool and gave a false name, Tomas Sanchez. When the agents asked for identification, he claimed he didn't have any. He was simply an American tourist returning from a day trip to Mexico. The agents coolly told him to come inside for questioning. He went without a fight, believing this minor misunderstanding would soon be clear. The gang leader was already in FBI custody, and he didn't even know it. Camacho was taken to the Border Patrol office and fingerprinted. Bailey let him stew in the cell for over two hours, while agents waited for a computer match on the prints. Camacho didn't break his silence. I addressed him as Tomas Sanchez, and, and he acknowledged that, and I says, well, we have taken your fingerprints, we have run them through the computer at uh, the FBI in Washington, D.C., and the computer says that you're not Tomas Sanchez, you're in fact Gino Camacho. And he said, well, if that's what the computer says, it must be so. But Camacho denied knowing anything about the murders. To the end, he never admitted any involvement in the kidnapping and murders. He claimed the FBI had framed him for the crimes. The arrest of Gino Camacho made page one news across the Southwest. From the border, he was moved to a cell in Dallas County and charged with firearms violations, kidnapping, conspiracy, and capital murder. Camacho and the rest of his gang were prosecuted by the authorities. David Cook received 24 years for his part in the murders and kidnapping. Spencer Stanley got a life sentence for the three murders he helped carry out. Juan Jackson earned a life sentence for his involvement. Fast Eddie Cummings and Larry Merrill got eight years each. Sam Wright had to serve his prior drug sentence as well as additional time for fugitive flight. But for Camacho himself, state prosecutors sought the death penalty. For the state of Texas to put a man to death, the prosecution must prove more than premeditation. It must show the accused remains a threat to society. For this reason, Camacho was tried on the state murder charge first. Otherwise, a conviction on the federal charges would have sent Camacho to prison, where any threat he posed to society would have been removed. In separate trials, Gino Camacho was found guilty for murder and kidnapping. The sentence was carried out 10 years after the deaths of Andre and Evelyn Banks and Pamela Miller.
On August 26, 1998, the state of Texas executed Gino Camacho by lethal injection.